Good evening. Great to see you all here. Uh, and welcome to tonight's event, Out of the Blue, Order from Chaos, a reading and conversation with British poet Simon Armitage. My name is Vivian Schmidt. I'm the Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Director of the Center for International Relations here at Boston University. Tonight's event is the seventh in a series of conversations with European artists and writers being organized by the Institute for Human Sciences at Boston University in collaboration with the Center for, Interna for International Relations at Boston University, the literary journal Agni, the American Literary Translators Association, and Zephyr Press. Previous speakers in the series, among others, include German author Bernard Schlink, the filmmaker Agnes Varda, German-Turkish poet Zafir Senocak, and the Basque writer Bernardo Atzaga. In two weeks, we host another British poet, Kieran Wynne, for a discussion hosted by our own Christopher Ricks. We also look forward to visits by German filmmaker Ulrike Oettinger, the former dissident Wolf Biermann, Swedish poet Goran Sonevi, Slovenian poet Tomas Salamon, and the artist Krzysztof Wodiszko. I think I probably didn't quite get that last one. Uh, okay, so be sure to pick up the schedule of our upcoming events before you leave this evening, uh, or view it online at www.eu4u.org. This event, which is part of our Eurospective, Eurospective series, is funded by the European Commission delegation in Washington, D.C. We're very grateful for, to the Commission for their support of this initiative. Additional funding for tonight's event comes from the Boston University's Humanities Foundation. I would also like to thank our partners, Agni editors Ven Burkertz and Bill Pierce, Meg Tyler of the Boston University Poets, Poetry Series, Chandler Rosenberger from Brandeis University, formerly from our Department of International Relations, and Elizabeth Amrian of the Institute for Human Sciences, who organizes all of this brilliantly. It's a great honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Simon Armitage was born in 1963 in Huddersfield, England. He is widely regarded as the leading poet of his generation in the UK. Armitage's, Armitage's poems, Funny and Savage, reveal unlovely aspects of modern life, but they also glitter with comedy. This was a comment by Helen Vendler. Simon's poetry includes Zoom, 1989, Kid, 1992, and Cloud Cuckoo Land, 1997. And this last one contains the poem The Tire, adapted as a short film in 2000, and Eclipse, a short performance piece for young people commissioned by the National Theatre in London. His selected poems was published in 2001, followed by The Universal Home Doctor, 2002, and a new verse adaptation of Homer's epic, The Odyssey, in 2006. Simon Armitage has worked extensively in film, radio, and television. He also plays in a rock band. So at the end of this evening, perhaps we could persuade, no, okay. Another venue. Um, he wrote and narrowed, and sorry, he wrote and narrated Saturday Night, a documentary about Leeds and Drinking for England, both broadcast by the BBC in 1996 as part of the Modern Times series. He is also the author of All Points North, 1998, a collection of essays about the north of England, and Gig, 2008, a memoir of a life of music and poetry. His first novel, Little Green Man, 2001, is the story of a 30-something divorcee Barney and his attempt to relive childhood experiences, which explores the darker side of male friendship. Simon Armitage is currently a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. He became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2004. 2007 saw the publication of his lauded translation, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. His latest collections of poetry are Out of the Blue and The Not Dead, both published in 2008. Out of the Blue collects three pieces written in response to the anniversaries of three conflicts, a film poem about 9-11, a piece commissioned by Channel 5 for, the VE Day, for VE Day, and a radio poem on Cambodia 30 years after the rise of the Khmer Rouge. Our moderator this evening is Mark Feeney, Pulitzer Prize winning art critic of the Boston Globe, who has done a stellar job on, job on previous events in this series, and I'm sure he will not disappoint us tonight. Uh, tonight's event will run approximately 90, 
minutes, after which I hope you will join us for a reception and book signing. Barnes and Nobles is selling Simon's translations of Sir Gawain and the Green Might and the Odyssey. And Elizabeth has managed to get limited, and she put this in caps here, limited um, copies of Simon's latest volumes of poetry, Out of the Blue and The Not Dead. Uh, she got them from the UK for this event. So uh, don't rush out too quickly to buy, uh, because first we want to hear our panelists. So Simon, Mark, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Um, I thought to begin the evening I would read some poetry from uh, books which sort of stand outside my regular work, uh, kind of side projects, really. Uh, they're the projects that pay the gas bill. Um, and um, I, I'm going to start with something from this book called Out of the Blue. I think per perhaps uh, unusually for a poet, I work a lot with um, broadcast media. Um, I write a lot of poetry for radio and for film, uh, but um, more, more than for anything else, for, for television. I was just calculating uh, that I've, I've been working for television now for 20 years, um, mainly for BBC Two uh, on the national network and for Channel 4 and mainly with a company called <laughs> Century Films. And we make documentaries um, and they're, they're quite odd films really. Um, we make regular documentaries about uh, real people um, and their issues and then I write poetry uh, sometimes as a commentary but more usually based on their testimonies and then I give the poems back to these people and in the middle of the documentary they will suddenly recite a poem uh, about their situation or their circumstances. They are quite weird films. Uh, they can be a little bit surprising sometimes but we, we've kind of made a brand really out, out of these films and more recently I've, I've been writing song lyrics and songs for, for people in the film so as well as telling you about their alcohol problem they will suddenly uh, start singing and, and dancing. Um, we made uh, a film in um, a prison, a young offenders institute called Feltham, uh, called Feltham Sings, where I wrote songs and poems for the inmates. And then a few years later, a film in a women's prison called Downview, pretty much the, the same format. Uh, in between that, we made a film called Pornography, the Musical, uh, where I wrote uh, songs and poems for women working in the sex industry in the UK. Uh, it was one of those films that sort of watch from behind the settee um, through, through your fingers. It was, it, it was announced uh, when it was trailed as the most sexually explicit film ever shown on national network television. It, it wasn't universally admired, I have to say, <laughs> uh, but fantastic viewing figures. Um, and we've, we, we've sort of gone on really developing these films. Anyway, th this is all coming along to me saying that um, a few years ago, uh, one of our other national networks, Channel 5, asked me if I would write a poetry film uh, to mark the fifth anniversary of 9-11. Of and I said that I, I wouldn't at first. I, I didn't really see how it could be done. Um, I thought the language had become so overused around that subject um, that it was so complex politically. Uh, but we kept discussing it. I decided in the end that I'd, I, I could tackle it if we could simply make it commemorative. And what I wanted to, to write was a, a long, elegiac piece um, for, the, for the people who died in, in New York uh, when the planes had struck. So I wrote uh, a, a long poem in the voice of an English trader working in the North Tower on that day. And we filmed it in Canary Wharf in London, in an empty office there. This is um, perhaps our, our biggest office block in London. And I, I, I don't think I quite realised at the time that I, the piece I was writing was, I suppose it, it was for a, a, a ghost. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll just read a, a couple of sections from, um, from that piece. This is... Um, again, it was, it, was do, it was documentary as well. It was, it was intercut with... Uh, pieces of archive footage from that day. 
and interviews. Um, but this was from very early in the morning. I seem to remember it being a, a, a quite a brilliant, striking day. So this is the English trader in his office before uh, what before all, all hell breaks loose. That weird buzz of being at work in the hour before work. All terminals dormant, all networks idle. Systems in sleep mode, all stations unpeopled. I get here early just to gawp from the window. Is it shameless or brash to have reached the top? Just me in America, 90 floors up. Is it brazen to feel like a king, like a god? To be surfing the wave of a power trip, a fortune under each fingertip, a billion a minute, a million a blink, selling sand to the desert, ice to the Arctic, money to the rich. The elation of trading in futures and risk. Here I stand, a compass needle, a sundial spindle right at the pinnacle. Under my feet, Manhattan's a simple bagatelle, a pinball table, all lights and mirrors and whistles and bells. The day begun, the sun like a peach, a peach of a sun, and everything framed by a seascape dotted with ferries and sails and a blue sky zippered with vapour trails. Beyond this window, it's vast and it's sheer. Exhilaration, all breath, all clear. One of the shots in the film that we ended up using, which I'm sure you will have seen in news bulletins, is uh, somebody with a camcorder at ground level uh, aims, I think, on what looks like sort of full digital zoom towards the top of one of the towers where somebody is leaning out with something white. And uh, it's a shaky but largely unbroken shot uh, that goes on for a number of minutes till you get to that point where you realise that the arm simply cannot go on signalling and the person on the ground simply cannot go on holding the camera and eventually both arms go down and that contact, that's what seemed to be the only contact, is, is broken. <coughs> you have picked me out. Through a distant shot of a building burning, you have noticed now that a white cotton shirt is twirling, turning. In fact, I am waving, waving, small in the clouds but waving, does anyone see a soul worth saving? So when will you come? Do you think you are watching, watching a man shaking crumbs or pegging out washing? I am trying and trying. The heat behind me is bullying, driving, but the white of surrender is not yet flying. I am not at the point of leaving diving. A bird goes by. The depth is appalling. Appalling that others like me should be windmilling, wheeling, spiralling, falling. Are your eyes believing? Believing that here in the gills I am still breathing. But tiring. Tiring. Sirens below are wailing, firing. My arm is numb and my nerves are sagging. Do you see me, my love? I am failing, flagging. I'll just skip about um, 600 years now to uh, translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I, I don't know how much you know about uh, this poem. Um, it was written 
perhaps just before 1400. Um, we don't know who wrote the poem. It's uh, anonymous, and there's only one copy of it survives, and it's in the it's under lock and key in the uh, British Library um, under conditions of you know controlled humidity, strict security, and. Um, if you've ever seen it written down, it sort of looks like, I don't know how much you can see, but kind of looks like that, really. Like a sort of 60s lampshade. Um, this, this section is often referred to as the stock. And uh, within the stock, each line has two or three or sometimes four or sometimes five alliterating stressed syllables. And then there's this little bit down here, which is usually referred to as the bob and wheel. The bob line usually has two syllables, and the wheel is a quatrain, uh, each, one, each line of which contains two alliterating stressed syllables, and which must rhyme A, B, A, B, A with the bob line. And apart from that, it's just free verse. Um, and. Uh, I wanted to, to work on it because um, it's become a kind of academic plaything. Um, and there are marvelous and sort of priceless translations and restorations by academics. But academics aren't always interested in poetry. Uh, they're sometimes interested in, well, the original meaning of words and you know, medieval dance moves and that kind of thing, but not, not always in, in poetry. So I, I wanted to try and recapture some of the um, the noises that the poem makes, the alliterating sounds. And uh, the, the poem starts at the Siege of Troy, I think to try and suggest uh, um, a, a worthwhile ancestry between Greece and, and England, and then moves pretty quickly to um, Camelot at Christmas time, where King Arthur has uh, promised that he won't eat anything of his supper until something miraculous occurs. And um, right on cue, it does. Uh, a green knight arrives and says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, you can chop off my head if you want, so long as in a year's time I can chop off yours. So Sir Gawain jumps up and says, let this challenge be mine, chops off the knight's head, he picks it up, puts it back on his neck. I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this if you haven't read the book yet. Um, and says, I'll, I'll see you in a year. So a, a, a year goes by and it's, it's beautifully described in the poem. And then Gawain must um, set out to meet his destiny. And I'll, I'll just read that section from the poem. It, I think it is probably the most famous section of the, of the poem. Now through England's realm he rides and rides, Sir Gawain, God's servant, on his grim quest, passing long dark nights, unloved and alone, Foraging to feed, finding little to call food, with no friend but his horse through forests and hills, and only our Lord in heaven to hear him. He wanders near to the north of Wales, with the Isles of Anglesey off to the left. He keeps to the coast, fording each course, crossing at Hollyhead and coming ashore in the wilds of the Wirral, whose wayward people both God and good men have quite given up on. And he constantly inquires of those he encounters if they know or not in this neck of the woods of a great green man or a green chapel. No, they say, never, never in their lives. They know of neither a knight nor a chapel so strange. He trails through bleak terrain. His mood and manner change at every twist and turn towards that chosen church. In a strange region, he scales steep slopes. Far from his friends, he cuts a lonely figure. Where he bridges a brook or wades through a waterway, ill fortune brings him face to face with a foe so foul or fierce he is bound to use force. So momentous are his travels among the mountains, to tell just a tenth would be a tall order. <laughs> 
Here he scraps with serpents and snarling wolves. Here he tangles with wadwoes causing trouble in the crags or with bulls and bears and the odd wild boar. Hard on his heels through the highlands come giants. Only diligence and faith in the face of death will keep him from becoming a corpse or carrion. And the wars were one thing, but winter was worse. Clouds shed their cargo of crystallised rain, which froze as it fell to the frost-glazed earth. With nerves frozen numb, he napped in his armour, bivouacked in the blackness amongst bare rocks, where meltwater streamed from the snow-capped summits, and high overhead hung chandeliers of ice. So in peril and pain, Sir Gawain made progress, crisscrossing the countryside until Christmas Eve. Then, at that time of tiding, he prayed to highest heaven. Let Mother Mary guide him towards some house or haven. <clears throat> I'll just read one more poem. Again, this is from a, a film project, um, a film called the, the Not Dead, which we made and broadcast a couple of years ago. Um, essentially, this is film. Uh, this is a film about re returning war veterans, and in the case of this film, uh, from three different conflicts, um, uh, an older man in his 80s who fought in Malaya, in what used to be described as the Malaya Emergency, um, a peacekeeper uh, from Bosnia called Eddie, and uh, a younger man uh, who'd served in uh, in Iraq. And again, same thing as I was describing before. I listened to the testimonies and stories of these soldiers, and then I composed poems out of what they told me, gave them back to them, and they recited the poems to camera during the film. And I suppose essentially we were making a film about PTSD, um, or what used to be known as shell shock, uh, particularly during the First World War. and. Um, one of the things that I talk about in the introduction to the, to the film and the book is that I think one of the reasons why the war poets, um, the, the, the British war poets of the First World War continue to be read and studied um, is that it seems unlikely to me that literary poets uh, will ever fight on the front line again in numbers. I might be wrong, uh, but I can't see a, a scenario at present in which first-rate writers go to the front line uh, with a gun or whatever weapon in their hand. And I suppose I've been wondering how you could make war poetry um, when you know, the people who are writing it spend so much time away from it. And, and, and this occurred to me as the nearest that I could, I could get, as close as I could think of anyway. Uh, but the, the, the poem I want to read actually isn't in the, in the voice of a man, it's in the voice of a woman. I wrote it for Eddie's wife, Laura, uh, Ed, Eddie had been in Bosnia and uh, I think against all his training as a soldier um, was, was very frustrated at having to watch various massacres and not being able to intervene and, and having to go and clean up afterwards. And uh, he'd received an injury um, and never really got to the bottom of, of how this injury had occurred but he suggested at one point that it might have been through friendly fire and a bullet uh, had entered uh, his face near his jaw, travelled down through his neck and uh, ricocheted around his body. And Laura talked very movingly in the film about how this injury was that they'd, they'd done everything else in terms of intimacy and <coughs> their relationship, but it took a long time uh, before she was allowed to touch and talk about uh, this this wound, and uh, so I wrote this this poem for her out of the things that she told me. Sorry, it's all a bit grim. This isn't it? So, <laughs> I'm usually a laugh a minute. After the first phase, after passionate nights and intimate days, only then would he let me trace the frozen river which ran through his face. Only then would he let me explore the blown hinge of his lower jaw. 
and handle and hold the damaged porcelain collarbone and mind and attend the fractured rudder of shoulder blade and finger and thumb the parachute silk of his punctured lung. Only then could I bind the struts and climb the rungs of his broken ribs and feel the hurt of his grazed heart. Skirting along, only then could I picture the scan, the fetus of metal beneath his chest where the bullet had finally come to rest. And I widened the search, traced the scarring back to its source, to a sweating, unexploded mine buried deep in his mind, around which every nerve in his body had tightened and closed. Then, and only then, did I come close. Thanks. <clears throat> So I'm going to start asking questions, and we certainly welcome questions from you. You've probably noticed there are microphones set up on both sides. Uh, tonight's event is being recorded. So I would ask you, if you do have questions, to just go to the microphone. And as I see people lining up, I will uh, let you ask the questions rather than me. But until then, I'll ask some questions. And I'd like to begin with translation in that there's a sense in which you read not one, but two translations now. One from uh, an earlier form of English with Sir Gawain, but also you were translating the experiences of this woman. <coughs> Writing translation, or doing a translation, is that constraining for you as opposed to writing your usual poetry? Is it liberating? Uh, how does it differ, or, or does it differ? It, it is both uh, constraining and liberating. Um, I, I think it, it possibly works in the way that, um, say, trying to write a poem in a, in a form right, that it, you know, it, it, it constrains you to a certain extent, but in offering constraints, uh, it also tests your imagination. Um, it presents, I suppose, as a kind of puzzle to which the poem then becomes the answer. And it insists that your imagination uh, goes to a place where you probably couldn't have taken it, you know, left to your own devices, under your own steam. And um, I suppose if, if you're fortunate or if you're practiced enough, then quite strange and interesting things start to happen that you might not have been able to produce if you were just trying to filch ideas out of the air. I mean, w one of the things for me about translating uh, Gawain uh, was that, you know, I've been writing... I don't know what we would call them, sort of shortish lyric verse poems for 20 plus years now. And I'm just getting slightly sick of my own voice. And um, you know that you start, well perhaps you're always wondering as a poet how you can, um, how you can bring freshness back into your voice and w where you can achieve a new style, because style is everything in poetry. And I think one of the ways that you can do it is to combine your voice with somebody else's voice. Um, it's a bit like listening to a CD in the car and singing out loud and harmonizing with the Beatles. Or actually, it's probably not like that, but it, it, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a kind of, um, it is a sort of harmonics. It's, 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 it's about singing along with, with somebody else and, and, and you change their voice and they change your voice in, in in the process, um, the, 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 the 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 constraints around turning somebody's testimony into a poem is is more ab about a, a sort of responsibility. I think. I mean, this is something that we've been doing for a long time now, and occasionally I will write something, and somebody doesn't want to read it on camera. I think usually because I've I've um, not because I've got it wrong, but you know, presented with the, the facts and the nature of your own life, uh, and then being asked to describe that on national network television can be a little overpowering for, for some people. But um, again, I think those limitations can be a, a creative force as well. <laughs> 
Well, it's so interesting you use the word harmonics. Uh, a number of the poems uh, in Out of the Blue, all three of them are public poems um, meant to uh, deal with very large public events, political events. How is that on the same continuum as, say, uh, rendering testimony? I mean, here, in a sense, you were the one testifying about 9-11 or about uh, the commemoration of VE Day or, or Cambodia. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, I am. I, I am the one who's testifying, but... Um, Just ask me that question again. <laughs> Did, how does it affect, though, let me rephrase it. Mm. Uh, you're writing consciously in a public voice. Yeah. Uh, and just as there are things you might say to me off mic that you wouldn't say on mic, yeah. and there are things you would say at home to friends or family that you wouldn't say to me off mic, yeah. how consciously are you writing differently when you okay. are assuming that voice yeah. from when you're writing other poems. Yeah. Well, I, I'm writing differently um, because the poetry is going to be received uh, in a different situation, in a different context. Normally when I'm writing uh, what I would call my regular poems, um, I assume that these are going to be received in printed form. And uh, even though I give a lot of readings and um, I, I think you know, have read certain poems hundreds if not thousands of times. Generally, I think I, st I still write for the page. But when you're writing for a film, um, you're conscious, I think, of the audience being different, you know, not necessarily a, a book-buying public, uh, particularly not a poetry-reading public, by and large. Uh, also, the poem is not going to be visible. It's not there on screen. It's going to be delivered, and it's going to go through the head, through the ears, at, a, at a, a pace given to you by somebody else, not not at your own pace. So um, I think for those reasons, w when I write for those kind of projects, I, I, I suppose I, even though the, the, the subject matter might be complex and sometimes dark, I, I try and work, I guess, in a relatively simple fashion, um, you know, allowing for understanding of the situation, making it clear what I'm trying to say, without, um, I hope, becoming facile. I also, when I work in, in TV with poetry, always start any, any meeting with the developers or the producer by pointing out to them that poetry is essentially very boring uh, on television, that if you were faced with 90 minutes of sheer poetry, you would be almost certain to have lost your audience within about 10 seconds. And um, it, 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 we try and work out you know, what the impact of poetry can be in that kind of context. And I suppose some of that feeds into the writing as well. Um, so that the, pro the poem keeps changing gear. Uh, it keeps having moments of intensity through the poem uh, and then moments of dialogue and you know, moments of, 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 of simply visuals. You, you've also, you know, got to bear in mind as well that as these poems are happening, you're watching something. And, um, you know, we work very hard to try and develop a technique where the poem just doesn't become a subtitle to what's being shown. That there is some kind of um, ever-changing relationship uh, and ever-changing uh, emphasis between the poem and... Uh, and, the, and the, the visual image. Well, in a sense, uh, writing to accompany a visual image, it's not unlike something else you do, which separates you from most poets, the song lyrics. Uh, you're writing for music or kind of visual music. Do you find yourself in writing song lyrics consciously writing differently from writing other forms of verse? When I started writing songs, I, I just thought they were bad poems, really. I thought <laughs> I would get away with writing bad <laughs> poems. And uh, I, I've learned the hard way that they're not. And I have um, huge admiration and respect for, for song lyricists. Um, it is an art form in its own right. And it's, it's very difficult uh, when you have the mindset of a poet to shift across, I think. Um, because you're always trying to pack so much in. But for reasons that I talked about when I was talking about the poetry in the film, um, 
and also because a song lyric is delivered through the character of the voice. Um, it, it becomes a different thing. I mean, clearly it shares techniques with, with, with poetry writing, uh, but song lyrics are not poems. And uh, I know this might cut against uh, what some people at this very university have, have said, but um, Bob Dylan is not, uh, in my mind, a poet. And it's, it's unfair uh, to, to view him uh, through the apparatus of critical theory. And to try and prove this to myself, I've quite often taken uh, a Bob Dylan lyric into my workshop at university, and we've looked at it and discovered all the things that you shouldn't do in a poem. Um, mixed metaphors, cliches, um, cheesy rhymes, <laughs> hypermetric syllables, the whole thing, it's all there. Uh, but as I say, that's not a criticism of Dylan's writing at all. Bob Dylan writes songs. And uh, the delivery device by which these lyrics come to us uh, is music. And music is this strange, <coughs> inexplicable substance. And when you put the right note with the right phrase, no matter how banal that phrase might be, uh, were it to be written down or placed in a poem, something quite extraordinary can happen. So an example of that for me would be... Um, well, not a band I particularly like, but uh, you too have a, a song called Who's Going to Ride Your White Horses? In fact, it might be called Who's Gonna Ride Your, Ride Your White Horses? And uh, in the middle of this song, um, Bono, Mr. Hewson, sings, um, Hey now, shalala. Hey now, shalala. And it's beautiful when it happens. <laughs> so, uh, now, you, you couldn't write that in a poem. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how you'd even go about sort of recreating that using the English language. But when it happens at that time, it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful thing. Um, and I've got enormous, you know, as I said before, admiration for, for those people who can combine um, language and, and music. Um, but it's it, it's not poetry. And, and the song lyrics that I, I, I wrote to begin with were far too verbose and dense and trying to be... They were trying to be clever, but whereas what they needed to be was smart. How would you define the distinction between clever and smart? I'm just gonna, I'm just going to let it hang. <laughs> <laughs> Smart as in quick smart, as well as smart Alec. When we were speaking, you and I were speaking earlier before your reading, you mentioned that you considered translation to be a political act. Mm. Might you expand on that? Well, d I, I suppose with Gawain, um, as I said, this, this sense of, um, of the poem having become a, a sort of a toy, really, uh, an academic toy, and... Um, I, I, you know, I would still need to make it clear that I could not have attempted this translation without all the work that has been done on it um, within the language labs of, of universities, etc. Um, but I, I, I think you, know, you can widen that definition of, of politics into you know, the politics of literature. And for me, there was something about trying to reunite the poem with its with its original noises, uh, with the thing that made it a poem, actually, with the, the, the warp and, and weft of, of the alliterative strands. And, and to me, without that, there isn't really a poem. It's just sort of fine threads. And um, perhaps as well, there was, I don't know whether it's political or maybe just parochial, the sense of, of trying to bring the poem home a little bit um, we, we know through uh, phrases used in the poem and the, the dialect, if you like, of the poem that it was written in the North Midlands of England. And uh, this is, an, I don't know how familiar you are with this part of the world, but I mean, we're talking sort of Cheshire, South Lancashire, Derbyshire, uh, Staffordshire, that kind of area. Not, uh, not a million miles from, from where I live. And uh, I suppose I wanted to see Gawain back in his back in his 
is patch. Um, just as I, you know, when, when, I, when I read the poem in the original, I, I sensed the original author luring uh, Gawain from Camelot into his own territory so he could deploy his own language and his, his use of, of, of his knowledge of local geography. I mean, the, even my pronunciation of Gawain, I think, is a is an act of political re rebelliousness. You know, m most people tend to say Gawain. Um, but I know from the text, or I'm, I'm convinced from the text, that, uh, that, that, that we, we are able to pronounce it both ways. Uh, sometimes the poet alliterates on the G sound, sometimes on the, on the W. And I've always grown up uh, with pronouncing it Gawain, so it's kind of sticking to my guns. So I think sometimes you can be political in, in literature and in poetry uh, within, the, within the paradigm of literature. I think, you know, w without having to be political in terms of, well, b you know, big P politics. And I, I, d I don't know whether it's true in the States or not, but certainly in the UK, there, the, you know, it seems to me that the, the class system is still alive in w and well. And you could make a, a, an argument from the idea that even just to open your mouth and to utter one syllable um, in, in, in Britain is, is to join the class struggle. I, th this is not a kind of statement, uh, but it, you know, y this is how generally you are, I think, perceived in Britain, uh, the, w the, the way you speak, what you say, and um, I think it's in that knowledge that, uh, that I construct my poems. You have a pronounced uh, Northern English accent. Is that a conscious on your part? I, I haven't got an accent. <laughs> <laughs> Accents are what other people have. <laughs> you did not embrace the accents of others. Let's put it that way. I um, well, I've I I, I only live um, four miles from where I was born. I mean, I've I've travelled <laughs> somewhat, but um, I've I've pretty much always lived there. So um, my accent is uh, is my voice and um, and my idiolect. You know, it's. It, it, it's, it's what I have, it's, it's, it's my sort of free gift, really, and uh, it's the thing that I make my, my poems out of. So it's not a conscious act, it's not a willful act, um, although I, I, I suppose in, in staying in that part of the woods and I suppose occasionally using particular words in poems, you, I, 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 I've, I, I've been making political gestures. Um, Sometimes uh, in, in the UK, you know, somebody will refer to you as a northern poet, and sometimes they, they mean that as a, as a put-down. Sometimes that's a criticism. It's like it's some kind of subdivision of poetry itself. But sometimes it's a description of the work, uh, and it's a description of the themes, um, the language, and, you know, sometimes the, the, you know, the, the actual geography being described in the poems. And on that count, I, I wouldn't seek to, to argue you mentioned how you have traveled a lot, and one of the places you traveled to was the University of Iowa, where you taught at the Writer's Workshop, so you've spent time in the States. Is it possible to talk a bit about the difference between the state of poetry in Britain versus the state of poetry in America? Well, I, I could talk about that. I mean, I, I, it, it's very presumptuous and um, not at all um, you know, scientifically researched, but I, 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 could, uh, I could give you a a sort of um, an anecdotal overview. Um, I think that would be quite interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, this is something that I said. Uh, some, uh, a, a colleague of mine that I co-edited uh, an anthology with Robert Crawford once used the phrase... Uh, he said that uh, poetry in America had, had imploded into the universities. And um, my experience of poetry in the States is largely campus-based. And um, I, I suppose to a certain extent I'm envious of that situation in that uh, for a lot of poets who are housed within universities, they're respected 
and looked after. Um, they can earn a living and they can experiment with their work with a certain amount of security. There are probably many other types of poetries occurring in the United States, uh, some of which I've, I've heard and seen, but um, largely my experience of um, poetry in the States, and I would say that my counterparts in this country are nearly all working in, in universities. Um, I think sometimes that can lead to a, a sort of detachment uh, and produce a particular kind of poetry. Um, but it's not one that I would be seeking to, to criticise. In the UK, um, I think there's a general feeling, and this is a very crude statement, uh, that modernism um, didn't quite catch on. Um, there would be some people who would want to rush up and beat me over the head for saying that, and uh, who would offer endless examples of how that was not true. But generally, um, I think that you might be able to advance that partly as an argument. And I think in the UK, um, there is still this person called the common reader. And I think poets like myself tend to write for that person. And it makes me think that the poetry in, in the UK perhaps isn't the specialism that it is in the United States. And this common reader might uh, approach a poem in the same way that they might go and see a film, or they might appreciate um, a sculpture, or they might go, th go to the theatre. Um, and the, there is still, um, poetry is still manifested to the common reader in the UK, in newspapers, on national network television, as I've been um, describing on the radio. There are still um, many national outlets uh, that give voice to contemporary poetry. Contemporary poetry forms a large part of the GCSE syllabus, so all students going through school at 16 will need to read contemporary poets. Um, I'm describing a, a situation that might sound sort of, um, you know, better than it actually is, but I, I think by and large that, that audience still is out there in the UK. I'm, I'm not utterly convinced that it, that it, that it is in the United States. I, 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 there, there may be reasons for that. It may be that every country gets the poetry that it needs and deserves. And I wonder sometimes in the United States whether there is a strenuous effort for poetry to utterly disconnect itself from mass culture. I wonder if there is a sort of perceived political need to do that. Whereas I tend to think that in the UK, poetry and the higher end of popular culture are not too uncomfortable with each other. These are personal opi opinions, it's not scientific research, but... Um, the, the, I mean, the, the um, creative writing as a discipline is growing in the in the UK, and I mean, I I teach in a university, although it, it it forms a very small fraction of what I actually do as a writer. Um, so a lot of the poets that I know, yes, uh, they might be associated in some way with it with a university, but um, it's probably a, a sort of small fraction of, of what they actually do. They probably see themselves as working poets um, out there in in the in the land. Mm -hmm. A very specific question about your own poetry. You have a great fondness for lists. Are you conscious of that? And tell me about you and lists. Who doesn't like a good list? <laughs> uh, well, uh, there are some great poems all the way through English literature, which are lists. And uh, I suppose it's the list becomes the litany. The litany becomes... Uh, the incantation, incantation becomes the, the song, the repetition becomes the rhyme. Um, I've always been interested in p poets who have a, a, a speaking or a singing voice. I was very, uh, very taken when I first came across it with uh, poetry from the United States from the 50s uh, and the 60s. 
it just seemed so vibrant and alive. It, it, when I read these poems, even though they weren't necessarily monologues, I could hear somebody talking. And even though it, it wasn't the kind of talk that you would hear on the street necessarily, it was some sort of version of it. And um, that was such a contrast with a lot of the poetry from the UK that I was reading, which always sounded like yet nearly always a man leaning against a piano with a brandy glass in one hand and a cigar in the other. And I, 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 you know, I, I, I didn't want to hear that voice. And um, I suppose, you, you know, you, you hear the, the, the list a, a lot in, in speech. And you, you see the list, you know, you see the shopping list, you see the credits at the end of the film. You, um, and then I suppose in, in, the, in the poem, it becomes, it becomes the mantra. It has a power. It has a. a it can have a, a, a beguiling and, and bewitching effect. Something else that's distinctive about your poetry, I think, is how much violence there is in it. Uh, again, is that something you're you're conscious of, and why do you think that is? Uh, well, it's I don't know. Better to do it on the page than on the <laughs> pavement, I guess. Um, I think sometimes it's the, the violence in the in the poetry is 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 a it masks the actual nature or subject of the poem. Um, I think it's sometimes used as a theatrical device uh, to gain the attention of the reader, uh, to create a surface effect, and then. Whilst that disturbance is going on, um, I'm trying to do something else slightly further back on the stage. Um, it might be to do with my background as a probation officer, uh, where I encountered a lot of violence towards other people, people on people violence, and saw the, the results of that violence. It might be to do with growing up in Britain, in the 70s and 80s, which I think I was a bleak, dark, violent place. Um, it might be to do with Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> I usually try and lay the blame at her door whenever I get the opportunity. Brit Britain, during the Thatcher government, was a, in my view, it was a, it was a grim and violent place. And you saw violence taking place a lot on the news, the miners' strike poll tax riots, football ground. It seemed to be kicking off every, everywhere you looked. And I'm sure some of that has got into my, into my poetry. Um, it might be to do with um, violence being one of the elementals and uh, opening up connections within people who've become sleepy through the comfort of modern living. Or it, it might just be to do with the fact that I need help. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's turn to a, a technical literary question, uh, and that's your use of rhyme. Uh, you, you do use it, but not necessarily consistently, and you're particularly fond of, of near rhymes. Might you talk about your use of rhyme? Um, yeah, I, 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 it's probably to do, um, with, you know, with the notion of uh, of the voice and maybe a, a sort of singing voice within poetry. Not sing song, but song singing. I think Frost put it that way. Um, certainly, with commissioned work like the Not Dead and Out of the Blue, rhyme tends to be seen as good value for money. <laughs> um, and I, I think in some of the poetry films that we've made, it becomes a little connective device which continually reminds uh, the listener uh, that, that poetry is, is, is taking place. But uh, yeah, as you say, I, I, I think I've, uh, I, I, I've, uh, I've generally, I generally use either half rhyme or slant rhyme or near rhyme or close rhyme or whatever you call it this week, um, or internal rhyme, uh, rhyme that you're probably not expecting to occur in that place. Um, and and on the page, don't often fall into an utterly formal and, and regular rhyme pattern. Uh, 
so that you can't just... I mean, when I was at school, uh, we would be given a poem, and the first question was always to work out the rhyme scheme. So you'd run your eye down the right-hand margin, and it would always be A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. And then you'd feel like you'd finished the poem then. It was like a little algebraic equation, and you'd worked it out. So you didn't really have to read it. And uh, I, I think I've always, wa you know, I, I've, I've wanted to peop people to, to have to hear the poem um, so that the, the, the rhymes are somehow, they're sometimes embedded, I think. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, in that sense, um, maybe, I don't know, a, a, a traditionalist. Um, all, all the poets who I like and respect and admire and even revere through the ages have, have tended to use rhyme um, at, at some level or, or use pattern in poetry. I, I'm, I'm not exclusively interested in that. I, I am. I'm interested in in ex, uh, sort of experimental poetry as well, but I, I don't want to write it. You mentioned uh, the poets that you admire so much. Might you share their names with us? Um, Chaucer. I've. Uh, I've I, I've, I've really um, become quite obsessed with Thomas Hardy recently. Um, just those, I, I, th I think this is a this is a characteristic of uh, of UK poetry actually, sort of sketch writing, scene writing, and Hardy um, does that in astonishing ways. These little psychological mini dramas that he sets up, and. Um, you know, this is something that I, I still see in, in UK poetry. So, I mean, not the most recent examples, but for example, you can see it in Heaney. You know, if you take a poem like A Constable Calls, um, Heaney's very careful uh, to stage the poem on the, on the page. You know who's there, you know where it is, the geography, the geometry, the personnel, it's all there, pretty quickly established. If you take Ted Hughes, if you look at a poem like Full Moon and Little Frida, again, carefully staged, set. There's a scene. Uh, he, he writes a scene. It's not necessarily a story, but it's like a little sketch. And uh, I think this is a, a tendency, be it a good one or a bad one, that goes you know, right back, really, through, through UK poetry, British poetry, English literature. And uh, I see myself probably as, as part of that tradition, not consciously, but when I look back on my work, I can see that's, that's what I've done. So... Um, Paul Muldoon was a very important poet for me when I was learning to write, trying to write, the way that he could use uh, conversational tones within a lyric form. Um, I was much taken with that and uh, saw that as a, a stylistic device which might suit my own voice and, and topics. Ted Hughes was, I suppose, the, the person who, who got me writing. Um, for all kinds of reasons. One was that he, I had that light bulb moment with Hughes where we were in school. Uh, I was I was a very ordinary student and uh, suddenly we we were confronted with these... I mean, it still amazes me. I'm, poems usually, they're only about this big and they're only generally black marks against a white page. And there are only 26 letters in the alphabet or the one that I use anyway and if you <laughs> if you put them in the in the right order incredible things can happen and, and that's what happened in my head I was staring at this inanimate thing and yet in my head there was a jaguar or a pike or a bear and um, I didn't know the world could be such an interesting place I didn't know that it could be recreated using the language so I think for, for me, you know, he always really set the standard. I, I don't think I share his concerns. I don't think I write in his style, but it, he was the person that got me writing for that reason. Also, he lived just over the hill. So I, I think there was a sense of, uh, well, if he can do it, then maybe I can do it. Um, but, uh, I mean, the list is, I suppose, it's 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 almost endless. We're, yeah, I was talking about, you know, the, the American poets that meant a lot for me, Robert Lowell and Sexton. Plath, um, Browning uh, is important to me again for the speech, the monologues. Um, 
anonymous. Um, I'm I'm in the middle of translating another medieval poem at the moment by an anonymous author. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm very um, all my concerns are with sort of Middle English poetry at the moment. Mm -hmm. Question from over here. Um, thank you for the reading. It was great, and actually, um, the description of Hughes was very nicely done um, in terms of the poetry. I want to just go back to what you were talking about in terms of being a broadcast poet. And when I was first listening to you, I was so excited by the idea of, of poetry on national television. And I think you've gone through some of the ideas about the common reader. But there was also a time when you were talking about the fact that you were almost poetry on national television could be sort of subversive. But then when you were talking about how you actually constructed these poems, you were talking about how you couldn't actually play poems on TV, and so in some ways you had to adapt the poems to the broadcast medium. So how much, you know, sort of the malleability of poetry to fit the medium, I mean, is how much subversion is actually happening because of the fact that it's on television, in poetry, as opposed to the other way around? Well, I don't think poetry necessarily has to be subversion, and I, even though uh, I, I was talking about the, the style in which these, these poems were delivered, having to to change maybe from my regular writing style. Um, I don't think uh, I flinched from the, from the subject matter or from saying what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, is my answer to the question. Sven? I just wanted to follow a distinction that you made which I like to ask anyone who ever works in both modes, um, the difference between poems for occasions or poems with given constraints and then poems that you use the phrase filch from the air. Do you think the mind works differently? Are they, in your mind, are they two separate genres, poems that you write because they arise in you for whatever reason and poems that you know that you have an occasion and a theme, and the mind will do its dance and make a poem. And how do you differentiate? Or do you, or do you see one as more prized and important for you in your own estimate? The so poems that, that, yeah, the, the, the poems that I, I prize most highly, if you're allowed to prize your own poems highly, are the, are the poems which I write as and when. Um, that are usually developments of daydreams um, that don't have any commissioning agent uh, that are unlikely um, to sort of pay my way in this world but are the, are, the, are the things that I like writing more than anything else and they are usually developments of daydreams and um, they quite often don't fit into a book because they thematically they might be different from the other things that I'm writing but it's just what I want to write at that moment and you know uh, wherever the poem leads commissioned th th the other poems the poems for the radio the poems for film the poems for TV they are different because you know that the subject matter is dictated and um, however you might want to tackle the poem y you somehow got to got to fit the bill and I I I, I quite possibly think that they come out of a different part of the brain. The, the other thing for me that I've noticed in the, in the writing process is that I can sit down at the word processor and write these poems. Um, whether I'm in the mood or not, I can get on with it as a job. Now, when I look back about through it, I, uh, to me that, that doesn't make them worse poems, but it makes them different somehow. Whereas these poems, the poems that I, I just want to write when I want to write them. I could no sooner write those poems than I, what did, what did Larkin say, than I, than I could levitate. Um, I could stare at that for weeks and not write a thing. Uh, but these I, I, can, I can get on with somehow. Um, so so I, would, I would differentiate you know, between them on, through, through the process of creating them. Most of the poetry that I've written for, for television I haven't published. Um, and that's an acknowledgement, I think, of the fact that they're meant to work on the ear. 
and, it, to, and to be combined with visuals and to go past a particular place and they're not really meant to be seen as text or might not even work as text. And I suppose what I decided with these poems that somehow through maybe the forward in the book uh, and th their scope that they create a context in which, in which they can succeed. But that's why I've published them with different publishers as well. Over here. I actually had a question about your public poems, um, which I admired very much. Um, I, the thing I think I admired the most about them was uh, the extraordinary compassion, um, in, um, particularly in the poem about um, September 11th, but also uh, in the poem uh, in Laura's voice, uh, describing with this, with this really quite beautiful combination of formality and intimacy it was something that this this woman has experienced, uh, and and th there was something very beautiful and refreshingly non therapeutic um, about hearing it from someone else. You know, he hearing a story told back to the person and having the person having the opportunity uh, for the person to reflect on what their voice sounded like or what their ideas sounded like through someone else's voice. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you you mentioned that you usually uh, like to uh, write those poems or use uh, formal rhyme in those poems um, because uh, it's sort of good value for money. It's what people expect from a poet. Um, but is there also something about the formality of the poem uh, that preserves um, the, the dignity of somebody who's obviously in pain or, or is experiencing something very traumatic? I think uh, particularly in, a, in a, an elegiac context there is um, I also think that uh, the formality of the poem is used in those films in direct contrast with the informality of the dialogue. So it, it accentuates this gear change that I was talking about. I mean, it, I, I don't know whether it's of any interest to anybody or not, but I, I, it might be worth me saying that um, I never meet the people in the films. Uh, I've had ample opportunity to do that. But I've always been slightly worried that I will get too close, that I will get drawn in, and that I somehow won't be able to, you know, to maintain the necessary detachment and distance to, to create the poem, or that I will start worrying about using words or phrases or getting people to say things about themselves if, if, if I know that I am going to have to be sort of standing in front of them uh, when they do that. So I. I met a couple of people afterwards, but but never before, and I do it all through uh, video testimony or transcriptions or audio cassette. Um, but um, yes, I, th I, I think that's right. Uh, what you're saying. Uh, also, it, it probably goes back to one of the you know the fundamental needs for rhyme, and that is you know so that people can remember. Uh, what what they're saying, uh, you know, these are people who are inexperienced with any type of poetry. Uh, so to create within a piece of writing a little chain link of rhymes uh, that people can hang on to when they're trying to remember and recite this poem in front of a camera, which they, again they've never done, uh, is I think is useful to them as well. I'm sure that there are a number of poets in the audience, and they would be interested in a very mundane question, which is, do you have a standard writing routine or procedure that you try to follow? Uh, well, I have a little girl. Uh, she's nine now, and um, I get her to do all the writing. No, I, uh, <laughs> she, uh, my, my, I suppose my writing routine uh, is more governed now by her uh, school hours. Uh, at, at some points in the past, uh, I, I, you know, I would write any old time, um, but I, I can't write when she's around because she, she has, you know, demands on my attention, uh, which I want to fulfil. Uh, so that's become a bit of a routine, and the school holidays have become, um, I suppose, uh, you know, things that we've got to stick to now. But generally, um, I, if I'm, I have an office uh, which is at the side of the house, but you can't get into it from the house. So I have a daily commute of about five yards, uh, which, which I always enjoy in the morning, pack some sandwiches, set off, uh, usually into the rain. <laughs> 
and then get into my little den. And um, I suppose most of the time I'm I'm working on things that that aren't that you know not not this really. So it's this kind of stuff, or it's medieval translations, or it's film work, or I write non-fiction. Uh, I do quite a lot of journalism. Um, I'm trying to organise band rehearsals, and so I'm doing all that. Uh, and then this other stuff. I don't really know how this other stuff gets gets written. It just does somehow. I think it's stolen time. I think I've always seen poetry as a luxury. And certainly when I worked for the probation service, I was stealing time from the home office uh, to write my poems. And even now, I'm stealing time from myself. Um, just moments, um, train journeys, wake up, write something, or have an odd hour here and there. And It must be... Um, I don't know whether it's effective, but it, th there's quite a bit of it. I realised when you were reeling off those books. Um, I mean, maybe it's that thing about, you know, if you look after the lines, then the, the, the poems will somehow look after themselves. But it seems to get done. But I, I don't sit there in the office and write poems. That's one thing that I, I don't do. Can you talk about the place of humour in your poetry? I, I'm afraid that people who aren't familiar with it might think from the subject matters of this evening, 9-11 and talking about Mrs. Thatcher, that it can be very grim, but in fact, you can be, as we used to say when I was growing up, wicked funny. Yeah, I'm, I'm hilarious. <laughs> uh, I found out a few years ago that my uh, father had been a stand-up comedian, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know this. I mean, he, he, is, a, he is quite a showman, my dad, and um, he, he, he writes pantomimes and plays, and he performs on stage. And uh, but I didn't actually know that he'd stood up in front of an audience and told jokes. And he is a funny, he's a funny man. And uh, I think the house that I grew up in was was full of humour. Uh, some of it quite coruscating. And I, I've even wondered whether the, the poems are really the things that I wished I'd said at the time, and you know, that. Uh, Somebody had said something to me, and I'd gone upstairs and thought about it for 20 minutes, and rather than a sort of sharp-tongued, quick-witted response, you know, two years later, I came back downstairs with a poem. <laughs> um, but in the poems, uh, again, I, I, I think it, it's sometimes a sort of, just a smoke screen, or maybe the opposite of a smoke screen, something transparent, immediate, obvious, engaging, entertaining, a way of inviting a reader into a poem while trying to do the other work just slightly off screen. Um, and most of it's quite dark humour, I think, combined with violence. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else pointed out this thing about all the violence in my work. I hadn't, I hadn't realised it. I'm a I'm so not violent. <laughs> it would certainly seems to be the case. Well, you mentioned earlier the sense of violence growing up in England under Mrs. Thatcher. How would you characterize British society and politics today? Actually, can I read a poem? Sure. Uh, I was just thinking about Mrs. Thatcher. But it, uh, does, does, does Margaret Thatcher mean anything to it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote a poem um, during her sort of during the late years of her reign, um, and um, it's interesting because I think when it was published, I think this was seen as a very callous uh, and, and violent, uh, gratuitously violent poem, and um, I think it's taken me a a while to try and explain. To, well, I've sort of stopped explaining poems, but I, I think it, it, it's it's only later that I was trying to think of things to say while I found it. <laughs> 
Um, should I read it and then talk? I'll, I'll read it and then talk a little bit about it. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Uh, it's called Hitcher. I'd been tired, under the weather, but the answer phone kept screaming, "One more sick note, Mister, and you're finished." Fired. I thumbed a lift to where the car was parked, a Vauxhall Astra. It was hired. I picked him up in Leeds. He was following the sun to west from east with just a toothbrush and the good earth for a bed. The truth, he said, was blowing in the wind or round the next bend. I let him have it on the top road out of Harrogate. Once with the head, then six times with the crook lock in the face and didn't even swerve. I dropped it into third and leant across to let him out and saw him in the mirror bouncing off the curb, then disappearing down the verge. We were the same age, give or take a week. He said he liked the breeze to run its fingers through his hair. It was twelve noon. The outlook for the day was moderate to fair. Stitch that, I remember thinking. You can walk from there. I remember when I used to read that, uh, it, was, it was one of the first poems that uh, that I, I, I used to sort of read out when I started getting asked to do readings, and I, I think people were genuinely, uh, genuinely and generally a bit, a bit shocked by it. I mean, wasn't, couldn't find any redemption in the poem. Um, but, but, but to me, this is a, you know, an explicitly political poem uh, set in that time. A time when uh, it seemed to me that that government did not value art at all. This was a government that was totally in pursuit of profit. I mean, Margaret Thatcher said some outrageous things. She, she said that uh, there was no such thing as society. Um, it was all about the free market and whether you were trampling all over somebody else to, to get where you want. That, that was it seemed all well and good. And, and the arts were not valued because they, you know, they, didn't, they weren't good business. And I, I think all I was trying to do in that poem was to personify um, business and art in that era of the Thatcher government. Uh, you know, the stressed sales rep, um, pent up fury, hammering art, you know, the Bob Dylan character, the hippie character, the free thinker, free wheeler, freeloader, whatever, in that poem. Um, and I, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't think my my, my poems are generally sort of flag waving and uh, crusading and campaigning. But to me, that that is a. I know it's a violent poem, um, but it's it's a, f a sort of furious response to to that situation. Um, and I, I think we see the driver of that car for for what he is, even though he doesn't recognise it himself. I'm <laughs> sat here reading and explaining my own poems. <laughs> Could go on all night. <laughs> but instead, we'll take a question from Bill. You've mentioned a couple of times the other work that, that you do in these poems, in your poems, um, slightly off stage, or you said at one point, uh, further back on the stage. I'm wondering if you could put into words uh, what, for you specifically, that other work is. I know that's a, it's an impossibly hard question, but... Uh, thought maybe that might elicit something. I, I probably couldn't put it into words adequately, but if I had to try and summarize it quickly and off the top of my head, it would be along the lines of how people are with each other. I think that's the work. And... Um, I think a lot of my poems could be characterized as kitchen sinky or domestic or miniaturist or small scale. I think because I've got what is probably an old fashioned view that if you can describe how people are to each other and are with each other, then you might be somewhere along the way to describing how countries are with each other. Sounds pretty glib, doesn't it, put like that, but um, yeah, what we're like when we're together, I think, is the business uh, that I'm, 
I'm interested in. One last question from over here. Um, you describe amazingly well and accurately the difference between American and English poetry. And um, there, to me, seemed to be a contradiction, however. You said it's the same within a couple of minutes, that um, in England there's still a common reader. And on the other hand, you said most of the English poems, you imagine a reader uh, next to the piano with a brandy in his hand. Yeah. That's not exactly common, right? No, I was talking about uh, writers uh, who sounded like that to me. Poets but with, with that voice. But if they're writers who sound like that, then yeah. a common reader wouldn't be interested in it. Yeah, I, was I, was, I was talking about poetry from the, uh, from the 60s and 70s uh, that, that didn't excite me in the UK. Um, but how did it manage to maintain a common reader then? There's well, certainly I think continuity, right? Yeah, I, I, I think it, um, it had to get back on the rails, um, maybe. I mean, poetry, and this, this must be true for poetry in any country, is, is constantly um, you know, in, in process. It's constantly reinventing itself. And, um, you know, for example, I don't think, I don't, we, we sometimes talk about poetry as if, as if there's been some sort of golden age of poetry in the past. And there, there hasn't, as far as I can tell. There, there have been golden poets, and there have been golden poems, but there's never been a golden age of poetry where citizens and civilians wandered through the streets uh, in chorus, you know, with, with books of, of poetry in their hand and, and nothing else. I, I, and I, I hope it never, never will be like that. You know, when, when we choose to be poets, we choose to be poets because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of stubborn, obstinate, dissenting art form. We've chosen not to put on operas. We've chosen not to make films. Uh, we've chosen uh, to do these little things instead. I mean, look at it. It doesn't even get to the bottom of the page. <laughs> It doesn't even get to the right-hand margin. That's how that's how willful it is, and um, I think it, w it, w it will always um, have a job to do, a job of dissent. It is stubbornly not prose, and you know, if, if if poetry was the thing that everybody was doing and everybody was reading, then I I for one I don't think would be interested in it. Uh, I don't think it would be useful for me to describe how I see myself in society. I don't think it would be a useful tool or, or vehicle or material for me. And um, I'm just trying to re reconnect this argument to your question. Uh, something along the lines of, there have been times, I think, in the UK when poetry has become um, so marginal that it's not even obstinate and then it's had to sort of reinvent itself and get back on its rails. And there have been times when it's been in danger of becoming slightly too popular, at which point uh, it becomes a little bit more obscure for a while. But it always seems to me to settle back to, to this level. It, and it's, it's, it seems to me to have always been at that level. It's, it's kind of unkillable. And we were, um, we were being told, weren't we, a number of years ago that I mean that the novel was going to die and that I think poetry was was seen as you know the, the last thing that we'd need in this age of over information but actually it seems to me more more relevant than ever one person saying something that they actually believe um, in, the, in the middle of 24-hour days of, of noise and stuff and, and nonsense coming at you from 360 degrees So, and I, 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 I might be wrong, and I, I might be, um, I, I might be living in cloud cuckoo land, but I, I, I think there are still people in the UK who want to read poetry that aren't specialists in it, and I think poetry is still being produced that that, that is meaningful that people want to write but I wasn't I wasn't making a distinction between what's happening in the states and what's happening in the UK as you know one is better and one is worse because th there are lots of things about poetry in the UK that are, 
are not right and that are difficult. The, the reviewing system is terrible. Magazines are, by and large, pathetic in comparison. Um, you know, with the, with the vigor uh, that, that 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 takes place here in in magazines. But that's that was just that's that's just how it looks from the aeroplane window. I made you stand up for a long time then, didn't I? Well, I was just actually thinking about something you said in answer and two examples that you gave, opera and film. In opera, there is obviously a poetry that the music was written to. So it's poetry again. And a film, um, I, was, I, I don't know if you even wrote it. Do, do you, have you seen the movie Yes? Have I seen? It's an English movie. It's called Yes. It rhymes from the first line to the last line of the movie. No, I haven't seen it. Well, Simon Armitage, thank you very, very much.